Hey there, folks. This is Misadventurer here with the 8th Developer Diary for my Imperator Rome Overhaul Mod Project, Hegemony. Now in this video, I hope to go over a couple of things. First of all, some system level changes that I've made for the mod, and my first attempt at a gameplay implementation of the League system. I want to get some feedback on both those things in the comments down below, and on the Discord, which will be linked in the description. And then lastly, I want to go over some redesigns that I've done for all of the various countries that I've shown off over the last couple of dev diaries, as well as on the Discord. I have uh, been implementing a new sort of consistent design philosophy for every single flag, and they've all been redesigned. And this has been possible entirely because of my use of the uh, Imperator Invictus and Terra Andromeda graphical assets, which are of much higher quality than the default vanilla Imperator Rome. Uh, flag graphic assets. This use is with permission from Snowlet, and I have to give a massive thank you to them and to the Imp uh, Imperator Invictus and Terra Dominant teams for uh, curating and creating these excellent uh, graphical assets. Now, to be clear, I'm not, you know, taking completed custom flags from these mods and putting them in hegemony. Rather, I'm taking these different assets and then using them to create custom flags with my own designs, uh, orientations, and color schemes. So my probably hideous color schemes, because I'm partially colorblind, are not the fault of those mod teams. They're my own fault, so please only blame me for those ones. But, um, you know, massive thank you for being uh, given permission to make use of these assets, because the, uh, the new flag designs do go hard, and they greatly improve the kind of uh, aesthetic of this mod quite a bit. I'm very, very excited to show you all uh, the work I've done with these custom designs, and I will of course give full credit for this in the final version of the mod, uh, thanks to uh, you know being able to use these uh, these assets. So again, massive thank you to Snowlet and the teams for those mods for letting me use these assets in this way. Right. So having said that, let's hop in here and I'll show you some of these system level changes that I've made here. I'm going to hop into a deny to uh, show these off because that's probably going to be the easiest thing. Then I can also talk about some of the other changes I've made. I want to go over in this video. So once the game loads, here we are. Okay, let me just hop in here. Okay, so first and foremost, uh, I have made some changes to the zoom level, and the main thing I've done is I have set this as the maximum zoom level. Now, this may not look very different from what I've shown previously, but this is actually quite a bit more zoomed in than the maximum level normally possible in vanilla Imperator Rome or in Bronze Age. And this is because what's on the screen right here, once I finish designing the mod, will be the entire map of the mod, plus, you know, a bit extra that won't be in the mod. So this is, there's no need to zoom any further out than this in normal, under normal circumstances for this mod. And you're going to play this mod mostly zoomed in more to like kind of, you know, this level. So zooming out this far, you know, for Bronze Age, this is not super far out because you can have massive, you know, Bronze Age empires that stretch across this giant map. But for the purposes of hegemony, this is, you know, zoomed out enough, so lowering the zoom level helps sort of enforce the smaller scale and the bigger focus on really detailed uh, individual tiles and, and nations and whatnot that I'm going for with this mod project. So that's one thing to note there. Another change I've made that is a bit harder to explain without a comparison to show you, but I can kind of explain it as best I can with just my, um, my words here is, and with a demonstration, is that I've changed the time scale. Now, something I've not been able to do, and after about a month of trying to figure out if this was possible, I have to kind of cut my losses and abandon this idea, was implement the kind of 24-hour Hearts of Iron style time scale I wanted to use for this mod, which I do think would be a pretty interesting way to simulate the, the sort of a closer depth of this mod and, and the, the longer-term approach for simulating uh, you know, only a couple years of warfare as opposed to, you know, hundreds of years of warfare. But ultimately, I'm now convinced after the research that I've done and fruitlessly trying to find anything in the code that the stuff that determines the number of, you know, days per month, the number of months per year, things that have to change in order to simulate a 24-hour clock, those things are so deep in the hard code and so inaccessible to being recoded that it's just not possible to do. And maybe there's some weird experiment, experimental way I could do a workaround where maybe I change the, the displayed time to be 24 hours, which is possible with GUI modding, but then characters would age at the wrong rate. It'd just be kind of messy. So I've decided to cut my losses and instead focus on trying to do other tricks to simulate 
a slower time scale without being able to have a literal 24 hour time scale. So the main thing that I've done to change this is first of all, I have uh, also, I'll talk about the Navy thing in just a second here. The main thing I've done is I have, first of all, rebalanced the speed of all land and naval units. They're going to have a more realistic speed. So for example, let me go ahead and raise my army over here and just ignore, by the way, that this is the Bronze Age version of the army. We're gonna fix that, uh, or I'm gonna fix that rather before the mod is finished to have the, uh, the proper classical period looking army. But yeah, this is the Bronze Age version. And also ignore that the UI elements are actually, um, uh, yeah, the UI elements are actually kind of blending through the unit. I want to make the units uh, be layered on top of the UI elements, even if the uh, buildings are not, and I need to figure out how to do that, so that may take some work. But either way, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have uh, the unit basically start moving around and the ships also start uh, sort of sailing around. So on roads, uh, this unit takes two days to travel from this tile to this tile which is much faster than it was in default Bronze Age. I've reduced, or I guess I should say, I've increased the speed of everybody to sort of better simulate the scale here, as this area here is not particularly large, right? You should be able to walk across Attica within a day, right? Even in the ancient age. However, that's not necessarily balanceable for a one uh, day per tick system, which is what I have to use with Imperator Rome without the 24 hour system, I can no longer resort to balancing things around taking hours as opposed to taking at least a day. And having every single movement every single unit does take one day will cause playing at faster speeds to basically become incomprehensible. So the balance I have to go for is basically you have to sort of suspend your disbelief that every single army movement involves like a day of prep and then a day of moving and then a day of arriving. Because basically every single movement, and this is on roads between farmlands, this is one of the faster kinds of moves that you're going to see. These involve at least a couple days of movement. And similarly, uh, ships to move between sea tiles take a couple days, usually two or three days between sea tiles, which given the scale is much more realistic as with the, the game more zoomed in than the base game, uh, the scale of movement should be much faster because we're dealing with less sort of actual terrain here that you're sailing around. Now, to offset the faster movement rates that are more realistic, I've lowered the time scale of time that passes per tick on all five of the game speeds. So this is a bit hard to explain, but in the base version of the game, at speed one, every tick uh, second or every uh, tick day to day takes one full second, and then the next tick happens. And on speed two, every tick takes 0.75 seconds and then the next tick happens every uh, speed three ticks. So when you're on speed three, every tick is uh, a half second and then another half second and so on. And uh, it sort of works like that for all five speeds. So what I've done is I've doubled every single second amount so that on speed one, it's two full seconds per tick. And then on speed three, which is what I usually play on, it is uh, one full second per tick, like the old speed one. So if you're a very uh, veteran Imperator Rome player like me, it may take some getting used to to play at this lower speed. It feels like the game is lagging, but that's not what's happening. It's slower on purpose to slow down the gameplay experience. If, since I can't uh, mechanically slow it down, I'm kind of experientially slowing it down. So on speed one, you have to wait quite a bit for each tick, and then there it is. And then let's go up to speed three as another example and have you uh, complete a even order down here. So this is sort of the, the relative movement range on speed three. You can see that it's brisk, but it's not necessarily super fast. And this feels like the original speed one or speed two, um, maybe a bit faster because the movement rates are faster. Keep in mind that they're also on roads over here and roads uh, increase speed compared to non-roads by 70%. So off-road without my military priority to improve uh, road speed off-road, which now actually feels a bit more useful given the slower you know, time scale of everything. While on roads, armies move around pretty briskly, but when you're wandering around, for example, in the north where there's less roads and you're off-road, you're going to be kind of slogging through terrain, and it's going to feel quite slow. And essentially, given that I don't have the option to mechanically, in a gameplay way, uh, add more time to the time, as it were, the best I can do is kind of simulate it with a slower time scale and the rebalanced movement of armies and navies to be more realistic. So that's the basic situation with that. Hopefully that kind of all makes sense. I'm hopping back out here because this is going to be easier to show you from the main menu. But another thing that I've done is I've made a change, or rather I've implemented, not really made a change, I've implemented 
my first attempt at a gameplay implementation of the league system. And what I'm using for this, in the same way that the alignment system slash the league system is using the religion system, I'm using the subject overlord dynamics as a stand-in for the league system. And I'll explain exactly how this is going to work. So as you can see here, all of the current Delian tags that I have on, on the map are subjects of a deny. And this is not hard-coded, right? A deny doesn't permanently have them as subjects. The way this is going to work, and this is actually pretty easy to do through scripting, thankfully, so using the system like this is a great stand-in for this purpose. The way it's going to work is that whenever another nation in the league successfully challenges and defeats their hegemon for hege hegemony, right? So for example, say I'm playing as the second strongest Delian, arguably, which is Korkyra. They have the, the second strongest navy in the league, probably they're the second strongest overall. There's an argument, uh, Kios might be the second strongest, but I think Korkyra is probably the second strongest. So I'm playing as Korkyra, I want to challenge a deny for hegemony, and through means that I'll explain a bit later, and I succeed. What happens mechanically is that all of the subjects of a deny, this is the Delian League list, and keep in mind what you see on the screen here is maybe one third of the total Delian League or one fourth of it, as all of the Ionian and sort of Aegean Delian members, of which that's where the most of the membership is, I've not added on to the game yet. So all of the Delian members who are Denai subjects are transferred to be subjects of Korkyra, and a Denai is also made a subject of Korkyra because it's now a member of the League under Korkyra and Hegemony, right? Remember, uh, taking over Hegemony of, the, of your League doesn't like tag delete the previous hegemon, they're demoted to become an ally of the league like everybody else under your leadership, right? They may in fact be the second strongest, so you have to keep an eye on your former defeated hegemon as the new hegemon. And so through scripting, this is all very easy to do uh, compared to some other methods I've thought of for how to handle this. So if Korkyra becomes hegemon, they become the overlord of all of the, the vassals of the Delian League, including Adenai becomes their subject as well. And then everything continues from there, and all the dynamics work the same way. So this is how League hegemony is going to work in a gameplay sense. Now, keep in mind that there are ways in which the alignment system can also be used with scripting to affect the way different League members have their relations with each other. But the, the core way that their relationship will be represented in gameplay is through this diplomatic system through subjecthood. Now, these are not all normal vassal relationships. And in hegemony, uh, forming, leaving, or you know, creating or, or interacting with the kind of default, kind of uh, flexible and kind of sandbox vassal systems, like like asking someone to become your vassal state or forcing vassalage when you defeat someone in war, those are all not going to be available. I'm basically reserving the overlord subject system to be used just for league stuff, so that uh, a member of the dealing league can't you know vassalize somebody and then they kind of are part of the league in a weird roundabout way and they kind of screw up the the way the events work so i'm just going to not even not even going to you know mess with that so basically all subject and overlord relationships in this mod will be representative of leagues the one exception will be with parsa who i may actually have sort of their own league system to represent their uh, vassal states over in ionia i will work on that later though that is a uh, that's not something I've really conceptualized quite yet, because that's its own whole thing. There's a lot of uh, parser specific systems I have to create that are parsed versions of the other systems. Like for example, the the stance on parser for them is going to be like a stance on neutrality, which they can potentially change uh, based on different things to get more involved in the war. Uh, whatever the case, I'll talk about that some other time once I work on parser more. They're still very much kind of a a stand in or kind of a you know a um they're, they're not they're a work in progress, but. Getting back over to the League system, using the Overlord subject relationships in this way to represent League membership is great for a couple of reasons. First of all, like I just noted, with scripting, I can very easily sort of have a gameplay system to represent hegemony, because whoever has hegemony, what that means in a gameplay way is that you get all the subjects that are in the League to be your subjects and not the other guy's subject. And you make the other guy your subject as well to represent his new like ally uh, position within the League. So. That's nice and simple, honestly, and it's very easy to do through scripting. Another great thing is there are different kinds of subject relationships that I've been using to basically act as starting points for the different kinds of, of league membership statuses. Now, there's going to be probably three levels of league membership, Melos, uh, Stimakoi, and uh, Clerici. 
and I haven't designed the Clerici one quite yet, because that's a bit more unusual. And it's probably also going to be Delian, or maybe even a Denai specific, as it was technically an Denai specific thing. But some of the tags should probably be Clerici's, and making tags into Clerici should be an Denian option. So I'll work on that later. But at this stage, I have designed the UI and the basic sort of structure and mechanics for the, um, the two different kinds I'll show you here. For example, Korkyra at the start of the game is a Melos. Now, uh, Meloses are basically the most highest ranking league members. In the Delian League, this is a special status where they don't pay tribute. I'll explain a bit more about their obligations and what they do uh, in, a, in a second. But in the Peloponnesian League, everybody is a Melos because the Peloponnesian League didn't have a structure where anybody paid Lacedaemon tribute. Now, in the Peloponnesian League, Lacedaemon could reform their league and make some changes to start forcing people to become the other kind of ally, the Simicoi, and start paying them tribute. And they're not going to like that, but that is an option to a, a crafty Lacedaemon player or AI. And if someone else takes over the Peloponnesian League, they can certainly adopt these Delian systems to great, you know, general disapproval. But the Delian League starts off with a minority of Meloses. These are the stronger states with big navies like Krakaira, uh, Chios as well and uh, Mytilene are all Meloses at the start, as is, uh, actually Platea is a Simicoi, and basically everybody else is a Simicoi. So I'll talk about both kinds here. Just keep in mind that for the Peloponnesian League, basically everybody will start as a Melos, whereas in the Delian League, most people are Simicoi, and then a couple are Meloses. So in Greek, Melos basically just means member, and I couldn't find an ancient Greek word that represented the Simicoi of the League who didn't pay tribute. So I just have to basically borrow a modern Greek word to represent this. So a melos, here's how it's defined in the UI. Though this polis owes no tribute to their league, their hegemon will request their involvement in campaigns. I'll come back to what that means in just a minute. And then there's something that says confidence in a deny's hegemony, and then a number is depicted. Again, I'll come back to that in a minute. Lastly, this information down here, uh, Korkyra, and again, that the white text there shows the different nation here. It, it changes per nation. Uh, Korkyra can defect to the other league or declare independence, but either action will almost certainly result in their hegemon immediately declaring war. So this is basically laying out the structure of the Melos status for the Delian League or for the Peloponnesian League. It's going to work the same in both leagues. So essentially, um, let, let me first talk about this confidence system, because confidence is a, di is a mechanic every kind of uh, sort of league membership status involves. And this is the loyalty system from the base game. I have basically reworked it and sort of reconceptualized it. So unlike with loyalty, which does make sense when you're talking about an actual vassal, league members aren't exactly, I mean, they're arguably loyal to their hegemon, or that's a way to look at it. But I think a better way to sort of describe it, and what I've chosen to describe it as in the mod, is confidence in their current hegemon's hegemony. So what this number ultimately is going to represent, and don't, and don't look at the actual numbers because I've not modified those yet, but it will be a number up to 100%. What the number represents is the support that that uh, league member has in the current leadership of the current leader. So confidence, approval, support, you know, whatever you want to call it. Essentially, so say for example that this number was you know accurate, which is not yet, but let's say that it was. What this means at the minute is that at the start of the game, Korkyra has a little over 50% support of Itdenai, which means that they slightly approve of Itdenai's hegemony, but not that much, right? Not necessarily the best position to be in for the second uh, strongest naval power of the Delian League to feel about the main hegemon. And so the main way that the mechanic and the gameplay of sort of League shenanigans is going to work is largely going to deal with this confidence mechanic. So for example, say you're playing as Lacedaemon, you're going to have actions that you can take, whether through events or missions, where you can actually learn the confidence level. I guess you can always look at it in the UI, but you can basically uh, sort of affect the confidence level of Korkyra, for example, by spending some resources to do some you know, espionage or some other diplomatic thing to perhaps lower Korkyra's confidence in a denies hegemony. And any nation that's in a league that hits 0% confidence will be able to uh, try to defect either to the other league or to declare independence and become unaligned. Now, as I noted in the thing down below, uh, in the in the uh, the pop-up here, um, defection or declaring independence to become unaligned normally will result in an immediate declaration of war from the league hegemon. Now, very important note here: the hegemon declares war independently on this nation. The whole league doesn't necessarily declare war. 
And this is basically representing that this is a, um, a kind of rebellion against the leader of the league, not necessarily against the entire league in its entirety. Now, the exception to this is if it's a defection to the other league. If you join the other league, uh, your previous league will be hostile. I'm going to try to hard code it so that whether or not there's an active war going on, uh, the alignment on the country level of Delian or Peloponnesian sets you to be hostile to the other alignment all the time. And so if you were to defect to the other league, say you're playing as Korkyra and you manage to sort of organize a defection to the Peloponnesians, the moment you become Peloponnesian aligned on the country level, the rest of the Delians become hostile, but it deny in particular sort of goes to war with you and gets an AI boost to focus on attacking you to try to bring you back in. Although uh, defeating you in this sort of uh, defection war or independence war will probably involve uh, establishing a clerici on your, your destroyed city and you're not really going to have uh, you know your previous power level before, right? They're going to have extreme sanctions or extreme demands for your surrender. So uh, if you're going to defect or declare independence, you got to be ready for the smoke and you got to be ready to actually fight off your vengeful hegemon and perhaps even the rest of your league if you're defecting. So only defect from your league if you're super confident the other league is prepared to help you or if you've done maybe different actions available to secure, you know, um, sort of resources from them to help you defect, you know, a crafty hegemon of either league will be looking out for kind of disloyal members of the other league who are sort of contemplating a defection. Maybe they'll reach out with an offer under the table to kind of send them some manpower and some resources to help them defect and a, a promise that they may or may not keep to actually go and protect them if they defect and send an army over to protect them from the other league. So it could be a pretty interesting diplomatic game of trying to predict who in your league is going to defect, which you can do fairly easily by looking at the loyalties, right? From the point of view of clicking on the hegemon, and anyone can look at this at any point in the game, right? It's not just only the hegemon can see it, it's not a hidden information. Playing as Lacadamon, actually I can just show you, let me just hop into Lacadamon here. From the perspective, I mean it doesn't need to be Lacadamon, but from the perspective of Lacadamon, if I click on Atena and then I look here, I can see these numbers from myself. Like this is, there's no need to like discover these numbers. They're available for everyone to see, which is on purpose. So playing as like a demon or some other nation that wants to sort of do some, some intrigue and some espionage with the Delians, for example, you can basically look over in this UI and see, okay, who in the Delian league has low confidence, right? Say for example, uh, Calchus has low confidence. That can affect my decision-making on who I'm targeting in a kind of espionage way to sort of bring away and kind of entice away from the Delian League, right? So that's the basic way that confidence works in a kind of a geopolitical sense. As for how it works internally to, to the League, this is a bit more interesting. So the way that I kind of envision this working is that many events and decisions will have an effect on the confidence of all of the League members, or if you're dealing with an event that uh, deals with one particular nation, its confidence in particular when you're playing as the hegemon or in reverse when you're playing as that nation and you're dealing with the hegemon confidence is a resource that can be sort of spent or gained in exchange for the resources for example say you're playing as a denai and you've been doing a great job the dealian league loves you everyone's got like 75 percent plus confidence in you you can cash this in by basically sending out requests for extra tributes now this request is not prestigious and you're gonna lose confidence with everyone that you ask, but you're basically spending the confidence you've built up with them to get more resources. And you know, this is a strategy game, exchanging resources for other resources is a huge part of the gameplay loop. And you can basically uh, cash out your, your confidence with your, your members uh, through these different decisions and events, right? I might even try to create a custom UI that basically lets you kind of do different interactions. I might just add more interactions to the diplomacy screen though, to sort of uh, spend confidence as it were in order to get other resources. Now, another thing that you can do is you can actually perhaps um, uh, spend resources to gain confidence. So for example, as a Dena, you can offer to send resources to a, uh, a member of your league in order to get a confidence boost from them, sort of the inverse of the other thing. And both of these options where you can add or subtract resources for confidence in either direction can also be done by all of the different members towards you as the hegemon. So it's very much on purpose that I want playing as the hegemon of either league, whether it's a Denai and Lacadamon at the start, or you're a bit into a campaign, maybe you're playing as a powerful 
Delian like Krakyra or powerful Peloponnesian like Corinthos and you assume hegemony, I want a lot of your gameplay to really be about micromanaging your league. And you're almost sort of more focused on league politics than you are on international politics. I think it's completely authentic to the period for Denai to spend most of their time constantly like babysitting and min-maxing and micromanaging their league internal politics. Because keep in mind, um, one rule that I'm setting for league members, for all kinds of league members here, maybe not clear cheese who are going to have more restrictions, league members can fight other league members, right? There can be open conflict between league members, which the hedgemen will have events to basically get involved in to stop everybody from having conflict. And this is a big way in which you can basically interfere with the other league. So you're playing, again, as Lacedaemon, and you know that Calchus and Eritrea have a pre-existing rivalry. And maybe there have been events from their different mission trees to kind of stoke that further. You can basically spend some resources to not necessarily even just change their confidence towards Atenai, but increase their hostility towards each other. So they start fighting, Atenai gets involved and has to try and break up the fight. And then Atenai is distracted by internal politics and not focused on controlling the seas. You get some time to maybe send a like an army on your navy through somewhere when they're distracted. Like that's the sort of thing you can do with the system that I think could really add so much uh, sort of interesting ways for political interactions. Again, a major goal of this mod isn't just that it's set in this period and is otherwise a normal Imperator Rome mod. This is meant to be a conversion, right? This is a, essentially a new gameplay experience with a much, much, much bigger focus on politics and diplomacy and kind of uh, managing the relations of different tags more than Imperator Rome was by default. So those are just some ideas that I, I can share right now about how the uh, league system can work in a, in a kind of gameplay way. And let's talk a bit more about the different kinds here. So we've got the Melos. Um, I, I guess I was talking about confidence before. So let me finally talk about the Melos obligation. So it mentions here, though this Polis owes a tribute to the league, their hegemon will request their involvement in campaigns. Basically what I envision is every uh, sort of war season every year, so every sort of spring and summer, the hegemon will have events, whether it's AI controlled, so it's uh, sort of seasonal events that are hard coded, or the player will have pressures to do these events and, and send them to their members every year to do seasonal campaigns. They will reach out to all of the, the Melos members of the of the league to basically give them a couple options. It'll I imagine, for example, you're playing as Korkyra, right? You're playing as Korkyra, you're a Melos of a Denai. So basically, whenever spring begins, Atenai sends you an event when it spring begins, and they basically say, hey, Korkyra, you're a Melos, which means you don't pay me tribute, but you do have to owe your involvement in the war, because remember, the war is going on in the background the entire time of this mod. There's no, there's never a period of peace during this mod. The whole time, the Peloponnesian War is ongoing. And Atenai says to you, we're going to launch a campaign, and here's our goal for the campaign. Here's some options you can do to fulfill your obligation. Option one, give us a sort of payout of manpower, right? You send us some of your manpower resource. Option two is you actually transfer control of some of your ships to us. You give us your navy and we'll give it back to you at the end of the war. Option three, if I can code this to work, is you promise to send your soldiers into battle for our campaign and do things for our campaign. And if you don't send your soldiers to us, we'll get mad at you for sort of not taking it seriously. Uh, option four and five, which is going to get a kind of irritation from the hegemon, because this is not your normal requirement or your normal obligation, is to do a gold or food payout, where you can basically say, yeah, you know, I'm sorry, I know I'm supposed to send you some soldiers or some ships or whatnot, but I really can't do it this time, sorry dude, uh, how about some gold or some food, which, you know, they might like to have, right, they, they may like that you offer that to them, but your obligation sort of in your relationship as a Melos is to pay them in soldiers, in ships, or in sort of war participation. And if you offer them gold or food, you get a sort of a hit with your relationship with them. And maybe after a couple seasons of, of uh, sort of trying to buy them out with gold or food, which are gonna be resources that you may be more comfortable losing compared to manpower or your ships, um, the hegemon may start to get mad at you and maybe even kick you out of the league and declare war on you for not following your duties correctly. And then option six, which is the funniest and also most dangerous, is just to basically say, eh, I'm just not going to send you anything. You know, you know, let me see if you'll, you'll do anything about that. And I'm suspecting that normally um, the hedgemen will let this slide maybe one time. And then if you do it again, they're going to get mad at you. And they're going to say, okay, like, you can't do this. Like, you're a Melos. 
you're supposed to support the war, you're just kind of off on your island or wherever, I mean, that's a Kukaira specific insult, but, you know, you're wherever, I mean, saying you're off on your island is probably true for most Delians, to be fair, because <laughs> most of them are islands, but whatever the case, you know, you're off, not taking this seriously, you're, I'm mad at you now, you know, I'm going to demote you to a Stimikoi or, or something like that, right? And so that's the sort of way that the Melos obligation works, is it's going to be this recurring event where the hedgeman sort of comes around to, you know, with the hand extended to get their get their seasonal payout of, you know, whether it's manpower or you uh, lend them ships where basically some of your navy is literally transferred to their control. And then once their, their campaign is done, their war is over, those ships are transferred back to your control. So you literally lend them your ships from your navy. Um, so that's the way that uh, Melos's will be obligated. Of course, putting aside their obligations to be involved like this, Melos's can also independently, you know, do wars against the enemy and the other league. And I think there should be events or systems where the hegemon likes a sort of uh, the initiative of their Melos's and will maybe reward them or kind of give them a, an extra pass to not pay them one year. If you're a really bloodthirsty Melos and you're constantly going to campaign against the Peloponnesians on your own accord, Etenai may like that, or Etenai may not like that, and may not like that you're doing things outside of their purview. There's a lot of cool ways for the hegemon to kind of develop different personalities of supporting independent ally behavior or not liking it because they're not directly overseeing it. So lots of cool ways the system could work. At the minute, I just kind of want feedback on these ideas, and then I can continue fine-tuning it as we go. Now, the other kind of relationship that I have coded at this stage is the Simicoi. So the Simicoi are, at this at the start of the game, a Delian-specific thing. In the Peloponnesian League, everybody is going to be a Melos because the Peloponnesian League didn't involve tribute. But within the Delian League, most nations are Simicoi. And so the way it works is this polis pays 1 20th of their income to their hegemon as tribute to their league. And by the way, I did quite a bit of research. This is, as far as I can tell, the most historically accurate amount of tribute that Simicoi were paying, which is honestly not that much. So a lot of the uh, sort of history of people sort of like making a big deal about the tribute paid in the Delian League, it's sort of seeming like propaganda because this is not that bad whatsoever. But either way, um, Simicoi do have a gambling system where they literally do pay tribute to the hegemon. And again, keep in mind, what this, uh, let me try to get my mouse over here. What this is showing here is not necessarily always a deny. If the hegemon is transferred, for example, to Krokaira or to someone else like Amphisa or Mytilene, um, who they're paying tribute to is just their new overlords. So the Simicoi always pay tribute to their current hegemon, not just a deny all the time, right? And that's a big reason if you're in the Dealing League to become the hegemon is to start getting paid by all the Simicoi. Anyways, so the Simicoi, like Melos, have their confidence as a mechanic, um, and the defection thing down here noted is the same thing, right? So whether you're a Simicoi or a Melos, you can try to defect from the League, try to declare independence, and you're going to need to tread carefully, because um, defecting from the League will involve, uh, unless the current hegemon is extremely weak, right, and basically about to be overtaken by a new hegemon, if they're super weak, or if you're playing as them and you really just can't afford to deal with it right now, you can basically give them a pass. So, say you're playing as the Denai, and uh oh, you know, you just somehow lost a naval battle to Lacadamon and you're sweating because now you're not going to be able to keep them from blockading Piraeus and the long walls will fall and yada yada, right? And then, you know, Korkaira, you know, sort of sensing blood in the water, sends you an event saying, we're going to defect or we're going to declare independence. If you basically say to them, we strongly disagree, but we're not going to do anything about this, you know, we're sending a strongly worded letter to you, and that's it, then the confidence level of the rest of the League will plummet, because this is an extreme lapse in power projection, right? At Denai, letting someone leave their League peacefully is considered, like, the most un style thing to do, right? But on top of that, um, if you're playing as Korkaira and you correctly guess that a deny is that vulnerable, and this would be this would require some luck and to be just kind of very very informed about a deny situation, which given that the way it's going to work is all league members will share line of sight and other info like that, you can maybe figure it out by just being very paying a lot of attention to your game. If you correctly guess this, this is a crazy win for you, right? A, a crazy strategic win because suddenly you can become independent or you know, uh, switch sides to the other league with no fight with the Denai at all. Now, once you're in the other league, the Dealing League would become hostile to you anyways, so it's not like you're going to be free from hostility 
just because you guessed it denies too weak to fight you on the way out. But the way that I envision this working is kind of like the Rhineland event in Hearts of Iron 4, where the initial sort of action is the rebellious or disloyal uh, subject, uh, whether it's a Simicoi or a, um, a Melos, basically sending an event to a deny saying, I'm going, say for example, I'm going to become independent. I'm going to become unaligned, right? Um, Argos has been doing some shenanigans with my population. We have a lot of unaligned support now, and I want to change my country alignment to unaligned. And uh, Adenai then responds, and they're probably going to say, no, you can't do that. And then the subject is allowed to either still do it, and then war is declared from Adenai to Korkyra, or they can back down. And if they back down, Adenai uh, is super mad at them for having tried this at all, but they stay in the league and they're not at war with the deny now. And so it, it's sort of a game of chicken where if you're not sure if a deny is weak enough to not fight you, and you're kind of like hoping they don't, you might be in a situation where you puff out your chest and say, I'm Korkyra, I have the second biggest navy in the Delian League, I'm not scared of you. And then a deny, you know, pulls out their, their ship list and say, bet. And then you're like, that's a lot of tri-race. And you basically change your mind and you, you basically say, okay, you know, never mind. I was just kidding about that. And so what what should happen there is if a deny succumbs to your demand and lets you leave for free, they get a giant loss of confidence from everybody in the league because they kind of look like a, they look like a, uh, like a wuss. If they successfully prevent you from leaving peacefully and you basically back down, they get a giant confidence boost because they basically puffed out their chest and showed their whole league that they're not going to let anyone mess around with the membership stuff, right? So all that being said, I hope that the main takeaway of all the sort of league discussion here is that the league system is more complicated than just a default vanilla alliance. This is a whole complicated system with different mechanics going on, lots of events and things that can affect confidence and the relationship of different states. There's so many ways to really have a customized mod experience here that creates a much more complicated set of relationships than just having it be the default alliance system. Because to me, that works fine for the kind of sort of zoomed out macro scale of vanilla Imperator Rome, but for the zoomed in scale of this mod, I want there to be this kind of complexity going on that regular Imperator Rome doesn't normally capture. So that's sort of my general overview of the current shape of the league system. Please give me your feedback in the comments below. I would love to hear what you think about how the system has been described in this video. And I uh, just am excited to hear people's feedback and, and get, and if you have other ideas as well, I would love to see those too. So having said all that, let me give you a quick tour of some of the new banner designs. It's a bit hard to do this uh, because you can only see it in the top right here and it's pretty small, but going from kind of roughly the order I've uh, created all the nations over the course of the dev diaries, we've got a did I here. Instantly we do have Igena over here with their turtle design. We've got Megara, who I've uh, put onto a harp design or a lyre. This is actually the symbol they were using during the period of the Peloponnesian War. The pig symbology came later, and it actually was never something on their coins. It was just something culturally associated with them. So this lyre symbol, although a bit boring, is more historically accurate to what they would have looked like at the time. But it, I did keep their distinctive yellow color scheme. Uh, Corinthos has this um, pink and white uh, Pegasus design, uh, and then going up to uh, Eboa. Oreos has a nymph on the uh, the prow of a ship, which was uh, on their coin. Um, Chalcus has a, uh, a golden bird eating a snake, which is also directly from their coin. Eritrea has this very uh, sort of uh, very banger looking octopus design, which I think just look, goes kind of hard. <laughs> it just looks really cool. Um, uh, and also, I'm not going to say it every time, but Imagine after I say each design, the, the phrase, and it's from their coin, because that's where all of these designs are from. They're all from the coinage uh, from these nations from this time period. Uh, Styra has a bull, and then Karistos has a rooster, which uh, I actually really like this color scheme of uh, white on kind of dark blue for the rooster design. It's, I just, it, it really, it hits me, uh, it really hits my heart in a certain way, you know? Um, all right, heading down to, I guess we'll talk about... Uh, over here, so the Beatians at the minute are sharing kind of a generic black and, or kind of a gray and white uh, sort of shield color scheme with Plataea having the Athenian colors on it. I may give them all individual, like I said a long time ago in like the, the second or third dev diary, I may give them all their own icons in the middle of the shields, but that is uh, not something I'm gonna worry about quite yet. 
at the minute, their sort of similarity here is on purpose because they do have a lot of cultural overlap. Uh, and then coming out here to the, um, the Phytosis area, Elatea and Delphi share the same background, but Elatea now has a white bull. Delphi has a gold snake. Snakes are a, a big symbol for the Pythia. The two uh, Locrian groups, Amphiza and Opois, have a very cool sort of star design, which is straight from their coin, of course. And they have sort of inverted colors where we have a, a white sort of uh, icon color and then a, a light blue background for the Athenian aligned Amphiza or the Delian aligned Amphiza. Then for the Peloponnesian aligned Opois, you've got more of a pink or red background and then the black star, which kind of goes hard. And then Lamias has basically the same sort of uh, amphora pot design on their flag, which I uh, was actually, this was actually not even uh, from their coin originally, but it turns out their coin also had a pot design, which was a bizarre uh, kind of coincidence. So I'm, <laughs> it worked out that I had that as the original version. Um, and then uh, heading down over, actually I guess I'll quickly show you um, the newer tags I've created here. Uh, Mitalini has this design with, um, I think that is Hera on there. I don't remember exactly. It's some female goddess. Um, I think it's Hera. And then uh, Kios has a, this is the closest I could get to a Sphinx. There's actually no Sphinx icon in Invictus, Terrandomita, the base game, or Bronze Age that I could find that was actually a Sphinx design. So this is the closest I could get without other stuff being in the design too. So just imagine this is a Sphinx because that was the design of Kios, or that was the, um, the symbol of Kios at this period. Then coming down to the Peloponnese, where there's a lot of density of tags, Argos has this sort of front of the wolf design, which is straight from their coin, of course, and the same banger uh, sort of dark gray and white color scheme. They basically got the, the the house Stark color scheme and sort of design, although it's just the front of the wolf. Um, Epicados has the, uh, the, uh, the medical staff, of course. Um, Troizen has a trident design, and Hermion has a slightly hard to see, um, if you look closely, this is a um, kind of a, a woman on a pink background. I think this is meant to be Hera as well. Maybe it was, um, it may have been actually uh, Aphrodite. I don't remember who, what was on the Hermian coin, but it was a woman on the coin. Uh, Lacanemon, of course, has their classic uh, Spartan Lambda. I also, I was tempted a couple times because this is on a lot of coins, was to use Greek letters, which were used to represent the sort of uh, initials of different city-states. However, I thought that if I just had a lot of uh, flags have Greek letters, it would get kind of hard to, to make sense of them because different pictures and like representations of, of different icons is easier to remember. And the whole point of flag design is e easy to make sense of at a quick glance. So having super detailed, complicated flags would be more realistic perhaps, but would result in uh, sort of more incomprehensibility. So I decided to let Lacadamon have their infamous Lambda flag and, let, and force everybody else to have pictures on their flags, even though many of them had coins that had other ancient Greek letters like the Lambda. Leprion has this very cool um, sort of a battle scene on their flag. Um, Ellis has a slightly hard to see kind of a wreath design to represent the, the sort of laurels you get in the Olympics. Of course, the Olympics are held in Olympia. Uh, heading into um, Arcadia, the most powerful state here, Tegea, has a Athenian-style owl design. It's actually a different owl design, but it's also an owl. Uh, the Tegean coin from the period was an owl, and it has a sort of a gold and green color scheme. So Tegea may have a special mission to defeat Athenai specifically because they want to be the one owl nation on the map here. Um, and then the smaller states around them, uh, Mantinea has a bronze boar on a blood red background. Orchimenos has a uh, sort of a helmet design coming around this direction. Uh, Thigalia has a woman. I think this is meant to be, I think this is Aphrodite for sure. It's similar in design to the Hermian uh, flag, but it's a different picture. Um, Alifera has a bronze uh, sort of javelinier as their design. Uh, Herea has a uh, sort of a, an off-white. This is meant to be Artemis with a bow. It doesn't quite look like that, but that's what it's meant to be. Uh, Telfoisa has a horse uh, head on their icon. Uh, Claytor has a... This is one of my favorite designs, by the way, in the entire game so far, is this uh, kind of... Um, what's even the right color to describe this? The background is kind of a grayish color, kind of a dull bronze, and then the front sort of foreground is a kind of beige, so it's kind of a beige sun design, which I think just looks really cool. Um, Sophus has a, uh, a deer design. Uh... Caffei Caf has, this is meant to be kind of a, a, a thing of wheat kind of curling around itself. 
Uh, Thanos has a uh, Heracles uh, icon on their thing. Um, Philios has a white bull on a gray background. Psycheon has a gray bird on a sort of bronze or kind of yellow background. And then up here, uh, Karenea has a just a sort of a helmet design on theirs, pretty simple. Then heading up into our uh, Archaea or Achaea a bit more here, Daime has a uh, kind of a, a dark bronze Zeus head on an orange background. Uh, the completely landlocked uh, Tritea has a red goat on kind of a uh, sort of a light blue background or kind of a mint green background. Uh, Ferre has a lightning bolt design on a yellow background. Olados has a, uh, a wreath on a blue background. Patre, the second strongest uh, Achaean uh, city-state, probably, has a, um, I think this is a, what's called a tripod. Basically, this is a um, an altar uh, design on, it's a it's a red altar on a gray background, which is a pretty interesting color scheme. Aignan has a great flag as well. It's a bit hard to see at this uh, depth, but if you look closely, it is a uh, sort of a, a bright golden sort of Zeus design on a blue background. Uh, Raipes has a white wolf on a gray background. Um, Helike has a fish on a blue background. Bora has an angel sort of situation. I think this is sort of meant to be a, a nymph on a, a green background and kind of a red design. Um, Aigera has a, um, a kind of light or kind of a dull yellow uh, deer on a burgundy background. Uh, Pelene with their uh, Lacedaemon uh, sort of association have a kind of red colored, almost an ochre, uh, I don't know if you say it like that, ochre, uh, kind of a ram design on a gray background. And I already mentioned Psycheon. So there's a lot of, there's a lot going on here. And some of these uh, designs are a little, maybe a little hard to make out, out, but I can only do so many, you know, sharp color contrasts of, you know, uh, gray and white or white background and, and black foreground. Because at some level, I want the detail of these designs, which are all phenomenal. And again, coming straight from, uh, with, uh, you know, permission granted and a lot of gratitude, coming straight from the Invictus and Terra Andromeda coat of arms uh, GFX uh, asset folders. Most of them are, at least not all of them, but the vast majority are. So I wanted to make sure that these designs were, you know, varied, but also still felt coherent. And the main thing I've done to achieve a sense of coherence is, and it's a bit hard to see at this uh, distance, but if I just uh, go into a game here, let me just pick someone random. I don't know, I'll pick, uh, I guess, uh, Tegea. Is every single flag has the same sort of Greek borders on the top and bottom. Those borders are added in every flag by me separately. So the borders are not part of the flags by default in, in Pair to Rome. Those are added, and the, the fact that they kind of curve with the flag graphic is also a fun part of how the graphic is rendered, which is a great detail. But this kind of Greek border, it kind of makes it feel like each flag design is a like a kind of, of a face of a piece of pottery. A lot of our knowledge of ancient Greek iconography comes from pottery more so than anything else. And so each flag feels like you're looking at kind of a, like this one's a great example. Like this feels like a kind of an image from a piece of pottery with the borders framing it on top and bottom. So this border design is on every single Greek tag that I'll have in this mod. It's a consistent design element to help uh, give a sense of visual cohesion to the entire playable map. And so my plan is ultimately that all of the Greek nations will have the same kind of coherent flag design. And again, all these designs are sourced from the coinage first and foremost. So that basically, I know this wasn't necessarily the closest look because I wasn't able to go into every nation individually. Given I have to go out of the game and into the game for each time, that would take way too long, but you get the basic idea. So. That basically sums it up for this dev diary. Hopefully this was interesting. Let me know in the comments down below your feedback on the gameplay changes and the new system that I've in implemented for um, the, the membership. And let me know if you think that's a good system, if you have any concerns about how that's going to work in a gameplay way, or what you're most excited about seeing next as I continue working both on uh, adding new areas. I'm currently working, by the way, on designing the, um, how do you even say this? the Arcranania and the Aetolia regions, which I've started to lay out here. I've started to set up actual provinces. I haven't done the tags over here yet or the, the flags or anything, but I've started working on these areas and that's what I'm going to work on next. Then after that, I'm going to start working on stuff more in Northern Greece, as well as stuff in the Cyclades and the um, Aegean areas. But whatever the case, let me know what you think about everything I talked about in this video. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all next time.